Good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to see all of you in the social hall. That's right. But I know that we have lots of people on Zoom, and I'm very excited about that. My name is Ellie M. Binder. I am the chair of the Liz Court Committee, and I do welcome all of you here. I wanted to let you know that last Monday night, I was privileged to see a preview of the new documentary by Ken Burns called United States and the Holocaust. The documentary is a very powerful and very thought-provoking program, and I urge all of you to please take the time and view it. I mentioned the documentary to you because tonight we, the Lizcore Committee at Temple Beth Am, are proud to also pre present to you another personal story from our own community. Tonight, Alan Alter, one of our longtime Bethlehem members will share his family's stories and the history of how far he has traced it back. Liz Court to remember the stories of our community members and their families for future generations. This is our mission. So thank you to the Liz Court Committee, Rabbi Cantor. Thank you to Bill Rapkin and Howie Goldberg for setting up and allowing us to be able to Zoom in the social hall. And I am now very happy to present Rabbi Blumberg, who's going to bring you an introduction of Alan Alton. Thank you, Ellie, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight, either in person or on Zoom. It's a really, really special night of memory, right? That is what we are all about as a group of people is memory. These core to remember in 10 days from right now, we will be gathering together as we welcome a new Jewish year, Rosh Hashanah, which is also known as Yom Hazikaron. It is the day of memory. It's a time when we look back, when we look at our past, when we think about what it is that's made us who we are. And that is so much of what our Lee's Core project is all about. So we are thrilled and honored that Alan Alter has um, reached out to us to share his story uh, as part of our Lee's Core project in the spring. He sat down also with our um, high school students to record an interview and to be uh, interviewed by them as part of our Lee's Core project. And so um, as, as part of this project of memory, we are just so honored. Just to say a few words about Alan. Alan Alter is a longtime Temple Beth Am member and the former Religious Practices Committee chair. He is not a child or grandchild of Holocaust survivors, but his extended family includes both Holocaust survivors and victims. Alan has worked as a business researcher, journalist, and editor for most of his career, and majored in European history in college and grad school. So honored to welcome and invite Alan Alter to share his family's story. Thank you all for coming this evening, and also thank those who are watching on Zoom. I'm going to start with a very special family reunion that took place in June 2020 on Zoom, of course, because it was the height of the beginning of the pandemic. Now, all family reunions, of course, are special, uh, but this one, to me, was extra special because it was a reunion of a family that had been split apart by the Holocaust. It was a reunion of four generations of American cousins who were meeting two Israeli cousins that they didn't know existed, and vice versa. And this reunion was a very happy milestone in my search to discover my family's Holocaust stories and the towns we came from. Now, I am sure there are many of you out there who, like me, knew the Holocaust affected their family, but didn't really know how it did. And perhaps all you have to go by, like me, are a few random names, a few fragments of family story, a few facts. Maybe they're accurate, maybe they're not. And what I found is that with curiosity, by talking to older family members, by looking at old photos, 
and exploring the resources on the internet, you can find and make amazing discoveries. All I knew before was my grandmother had lost sisters and a brother in the Holocaust and had a brother who escaped and went to Israel. So I was named after one of the brothers who died in the Holocaust. Then my mother had a cousin in California who was a survivor. I knew the Yiddish names of two of my ancestral hometowns. What I learned is what happened to my grandmother's siblings. So I had family I didn't know in Israel. I learned of survival stories of a great uncle I knew about, a great uncle I didn't even know existed, and a cousin in California. And I learned what happened to my ancestral towns during the Holocaust, as well as how the Holocaust is remembered there. In this talk, I'm going to tell you three stories of discovering my family's Holocaust stories. My hope is that these stories will give you ideas on how to remember the forgotten people in your family. My first story is about the family that lived. My great uncle Moshe, his wife, and his four sons. But this story really begins with my grandmother, Lena. Lena was a tiny woman with a very heavy Polish Jewish accent who became blind when my mother was four. She never talked or almost never talked about her early life. Growing up about all I knew was that she grew up in Poland in a place she called Bangoro, that her family was poor, that she came to America when she was a young woman after her mother died, that she had an older sister here in America that we call Tante Temel, and that she left behind, as you can see by the photo on the right, her father and her other siblings. I was told that these siblings who stayed in Poland had died in the Holocaust, except for one, the man on the far right, her brother, Moshe, who survived and lived in Israel. All my mother knew was that his family escaped east to the Soviet Union in the early days of the war, that he fought in the Red Army while the rest of the family worked in the factory somewhere in the Earl Mountains. And after the war, he found his family, that they went to a deacon camp, and they contacted my grandmother from there, that the sons were recruited in, in the camp by the Haganah. They wanted to go to Palestine and South America, and they did. But in time, the Israeli and the American branches lost touch. We didn't speak Hebrew, and we hardly knew any Yiddish at all. The four brothers and their wives didn't know any English. So, flash forward to 10 years ago. I want to know more about the family history. How did my great uncle Moshe and his family survive? What happened to their family? I no longer had their address, so I couldn't find out from them. And what happened to the rest of my grandmother's family who she left behind in Poland? And what's more, the stories I heard from my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, they were all in the late 80s when I talked to them about it in the respective times, of course, it was really just a few secondhand fragments. I couldn't be sure that their memories were, ac were accurate. As I began to explore my family history, I found that my mother had held on to dozens, maybe even hundreds of old family photos. I also discovered there are hundreds of resources available to help me find records and to connect with other researchers. I took advantage of them as I conducted my search. These resources fall into five major categories, and each of them contain many sites, and most of them are free. One major type is what I would call Jewish genealogy and Holocaust sites. Jewish Gen is an umbrella site for finding birth, death, marriage, and other records in Jewish communities all over the world. And it also provides ways to connect researchers looking for the same family names or towns. The Arelson Archives, Yad Vashem, the U.S. Holocaust Museum, and the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation all have gathered Holocaust-specific records. And there are also international and local genealogy organizations that hold meetings, conferences, and have people who can help you such as the International Association of Jewish Genealogy Societies. There is also a Greater Boston 
Jewish Genealogy Society as well that meets about every month. Another category are, or, are uh, sites for finding official records. There are sites for finding Ellis Island records, for census records. And then there's also a site created by Stephen Morse. He's a retired engineer who has devoted his retirement time to creating a remarkable web page that contains hundreds of links for finding records from Ellis Island, other ports of entry, and other government agencies. Of course, there's also social media. Facebook hosts both public and private groups devoted to Jewish genealogy and the Holocaust. These Facebook groups have discussion threads and often have members who provide suggestions for resources. And there are also separately blogs by photographers who roam Eastern Europe photographing what survives of Jewish life in Eastern Europe, such as the Vanished World blog by the remarkable German photographer Christian Hermann. Another very special resource are Yisker books. After the war, Holocaust survivors compiled memories and lists of lost family members from their towns. The New York Public Library and the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst has digitized them. And other sites, such as Kahila Links, part of Jewish Gen, host pages about specific towns. And they have more information they take from those Yisker books, including indices, which make it easier to find material in these Yisker books. The last category, and the one you probably see on television advertisements, are aggregator sites and DNA testing sites. These are private companies, and there are also a few nonprofits as well, which have compiled millions of records and made them easier to search. And some of these, of course, offer DNA testing service that will not just tell you your ethnic DNA background, but also will connect you or point you to people who have DNA matches with you. I drew from all of those kinds of resources in the past 10 years to help put together these stories that I'm going to tell you tonight and make these discoveries. And these are sources which are available to everyone in the room and everyone on Zoom. First thing I tried to do is confirm the connection to this place called Bangaro. I found my grandmother, it began with the Ellis Island site. I found my grandmother's Ellis Island records. And they confirmed that she came from a town that, um, on paper, and anyway, it looked a lot like Bangalore, even if the spelling was a bit different. I went to Google, I typed it in, and I found that there were a number of alternate spellings for this town. And the Polish was spelled W-E-G-R-O-W with, with Polish accents. When I went to Google Maps, I found the town. It was about located about 50 miles east of Warsaw. And then they went to Jewish Gen, typed in the town, and typed in the names of the family members. And I found birth and marriage records and death records. And these records confirm that my grandmother came there and had names of their siblings, of her siblings, all the, when they were born in Vanderbilt. I had the record of the family. I knew where they came from. But how to trace Moshe's steps? how he got to Israel from Bangalore. That took longer, but I was able to make it. I learned from one of those Facebook genealogy, Jewish genealogy groups I subscribed to, that there existed records of Polish Jews who escaped to the Soviet Union. The stevemorse.com site had a link to them and had an easy way to search the site in English. And I found the family. It confirmed that the family had fled east to the Soviet Union, like my grand, like the stories I had heard from my family. It showed that they arrived at a city called Perest, which is on the Belarusian side of the border now, in Belarus and Poland. But after that, the trail didn't connect really with, for a little while, the family lore. There were differences because steamorse.com also had a way to search Siberian refugee camp records. And I went to that and again entered the names. And the records show that they were deported not to the Ural Mountains, but to the Arctic, 
specifically the Archangelus district far, far north of Moscow on the White Sea. The family remained there for over a year and then were deported again, somewhere near Stalingrad. And there is nothing about Moshe in these records, though, being in the Red Army, nothing about other deportation. But then I had a photo that I found in my mother's connection, my father, that my mother had, and the trail picked up again. That this was the photo which told my grandmother that they survived. It was a photo of one of Moshe's sons, the name is Yehuda, that he had sent to my grandmother in 1947. There he is standing in front of a barrack at a displaced person's camp. And the, the back of the photo had a photographer's stamp. And it was revealed that it was taken in Esvega, a displaced person's camp in Germany. The, the, the uh, camp records, the deeper camp records on the Arrelson archives online, it turned out, contained their registration card for all these family members. It had other records as well, Yehuda and all those family members. It had the, the names, birth dates, and their intended destination, Palestine. I now knew much, much more about what happened to my uncle, grand-uncle Moshe and his family. And then, thanks to a DNA testing service, I was able to learn much more. I registered with one of those DNA services, and I had a phone app. And after I registered, you know, I checked to, I checked to see, well, who were the people who they found had some DNA that matched with mine? And I had the personal rule. If I find someone who has where there's like a 2% or more match, and, and they're in the list of suggest, quote unquote suggested DNA relatives. And if they list, if they list names of family members that I reckon, or last names that I re recognize from my own research, I would, you know, I would reach out to them and say, hey, we have this, we have this DNA in common. I see you have these names that are names I know, they come from towns that I know. Might there be a connection? And I reached out to someone who's, who's disguised her name and the name, now I'm just call her Jay. And I reached out to Jay. She made that suggestion about how we connected. And I asked if her family came from Bengaluru. And she responded, this is amazing. Yes, my grandmother was indeed from Bengaluru in Poland. Please tell me more about the family. I did. And it turned out she was a granddaughter of one of those four sons. She soon put me in touch with one of her cousins. We spoke, and thanks to him, I heard the story from the Israeli side. And it wasn't quite the same story I heard as a boy. And here is the full story as he knew it. Before the war broke out, Moshe was serving, but not in the Red Army. He was serving in the Polish Army. The family was living in Drahitsyn, a town east of Poland. His mother, uh, uh, Moshe's wife, Rivka, had moved the family there to be with her father after Moshe was drafted into the Polish army. On September 1st, the day of the German invasion, Moshe was captured and imprisoned. He was set free a few days later, somehow, and he managed to reunite his family in Drahitsyn. Now, this town at that time was now on the Soviet side of the line. The Soviets and the Nazis divided Poland between them. And they were on now, that town was now on the Soviet side of that line. They stayed in Dorhitsyn for a few weeks. But before, but because the family weren't citizens of that town, they were from Bangalore, the Soviets would not allow them to stay there. They forced the entire family to go east into the Soviet Union. And so they did, and they were in Belarus and Brest. And they were treated with suspicion, and they were deported to a camp in Archangelus in the far north of, Ru of Russia, like those records said. They worked in labor camps in the forest, bringing food to Soviet soldiers who were there. And according to the grandfather of my new newfound cousins, quote, it was a very cold place. We used to eat potatoes for most of the days because there was nothing else. My dad used to work, and we stayed at home. When it was dark, 
we couldn't go outside because bears and other wild animals used to eat people. The family was then moved to Kazakhstan. While there may also have been in Siberia, the, the Israeli cousins have heard different stories too. They do believe that their grandfather had spent most, and his family had spent most of the time in Arkansas and Kazakhstan. The entire family spent, stayed together throughout the war. Extraordinary when you think of all these families that were divided. This whole family of six people managed to stay together. Moshe did not get to, did not serve in the Red Army. They did try to draft him, but uh, they, they brought him. <laughs> the weather was recruiting and he wasn't drafted. Now, when the war was finally ended, the family was allowed to return to Poland. They stayed for a few days, but they didn't find any family there. It turned out that Rizka's father and siblings were all murdered in Treblinka. Moshe and the family then went to the Esfegi BP camp in Germany. And from there, they went to Italy, where there were other DP camps of Jewish refugees. They received help from the Joint Distribution Committee uh, uh, while in Italy. They were, uh, Moshe and Rivka were torn about whether they go to the U.S. And is, or Israel. They chose to go to Israel because Yehuda, the son of Nepomo, had already gone to Israel and joined the Palma. After all those years getting through the war, the Nazis didn't manage to separate them. They weren't going to be separated now. So instead of coming to the U.S. like my grandmother had hoped, they came, they went to Israel. Maybe there's still a few gaps, but the, the story that I only had hints of was now fully, in, was now mostly in place. I'm going to go on to the next story now. The second story of the great escape of my great uncle Mordechai. While I was searching for Moshe, I began to search for my grandmother's other siblings. The website JRI of Poland, part of that part of Jewish gender, both Jewish to Polish Jews, had identified, as you saw, all the other siblings. I started to look on the Yad Vashem's database of names. I knew nothing at all about my grandmother's older sister, Chai. But when I typed in her name, it turned out that Yad Vashem knew about it. She had married. She had changed her name to Tukvever, and she moved to a town in Poland that my grandmother had never mentioned. Through Yad Vashem and the Jewish Gen database, I learned that Chaya had married a man named Mordechai Tokvedr and moved to Lamsa, Poland, a town northeast of Bengal, not far from Bialystok. They raised three daughters who were born between 1914 and 1931, Yehudit, Tova, and the youngest, Nahama. I also learned that they had a son, Mayer, through other means. According to the Yad Vashem pages of testimony, left by Toba and a friend of family who had survived the Holocaust. That page is in the center of this story, the center here. Chaya, Yehudit, and the Hama all died in Auschwitz in 1943. But Yad Vashem did not have a record of my great uncle Mordecai. So I thought maybe he may, might be mentioned in one of the Yisker books for, for the city of Lomsa. There are three of them. And I found them in the Yisker book that was published in Tel Aviv in 1952. There's an index that I found on that on the Kahila Links page for Lomza, you know, which has um, information drawn out, which had been drawn out from the Yisker books. And I found several listings for the family members. It turned out that Mordecai was an elected member of the Jewish Community Council in Lomza. And he was also a member of the Workmen's Circle. A, a socialist Bundes cultural organization. You can see the photo from the Yisker book of him with other members of the Jewish Community Council. Turned out that the, one, the, one of the daughters, Yehudit, was an active Zionist. She was, according to a caption in another photo, uh, a, one of the Chachalut's members who did not go to Israel. But what caught my eye besides the photo of Mordecai was that he wrote a page of testimony. I found it, I copied it, and at a Jewish genealogy conference 
I found someone who could translate it from Hebrew to English. I remember sitting at a table with this volunteer translator. He went through the testimony in that, in that text you see here, line by line. And until the very end of Mordecai's testimony, it seemed every sentence was more horrible than the one that preceded it. Here's what it said. It said that Mordecai said, they survived the bombing by the Luftwaffe, which destroyed or ruined 75% of the homes in Lomzo and killed 3,000 Jews. They said that 2,000 of the surviving Jews took to the road to try to escape, but were soon overtaken by the advancing Nazi army. They were forced back to Lomzo. Many, many Jews were thrown from the bridge. Others were beaten on the road back. Of the, then the Nazis forced 7,000 of the surviving Jews of Monza into an old Polish cloister. Quote, we sat there in prison for 48 hours without any food or water. The air was stifling. The weak ones and the elderly just died because there was no air and no water. The stench from the bodies of the dead fouled the air. End quote. Then the Nazis forced the Jews out and sent them on a death march to Eastern Prussia. Those who could not keep up were killed on the road. Some were forced onto a freight train and those who cried out were bayoneted. Quote, of course there was no medical help and it sort of became a medic. I cut my shirt and I made bandages out of it and they helped take care of some of the injured, unquote. The rest were brought to a military camp near the city that today is known as Kalingrad. The day with a few others, he again organized what medical help he could. Finally, <laughs> after a month, a thousand people were chosen from among us. Unbelievably, I don't know how I did it. I pushed away the bodies and I ran to hide in the forest. There were shots crisscrossing the air right above my head, but I was not hurt. Twenty of us were able to run away, and we crossed the Bug River towards the Russian side. From 7,000 Jews that were in prison with us, only a few dozen were left." End quote. Mordecai eventually settled in Rama, Israel, where in 1949, he provided this testimony to a contributor to the Bombs of Yisrael. I shared this story on Facebook's Tracing the Tribe group for Jewish genealogy and asked if anyone knew what happened to him. The group members were kind enough to do the research for me. They found that he became a lawyer in Israel and died in 1964. Do not know if he remarried or if he had other children. My third story is about my indomitable cousin Hadassah. Sometimes you don't search for family. Someone searching for family finds you and then surprises you with photos and with a story like the likes of which you've never heard before. And this happened to me in 2015. A man named George found me through Jewish Gen's family search feature. Dear sir, he wrote to me, do you know somebody with the first name Hadassah that arrived in the USA? That name was familiar. My mother had told me that Grandma Lena had a cousin or a niece named Hadassah and that she was a Holocaust survivor. Hadassah lost her first husband and child in the camps and then met a man named Benno in a deep camp after the war. Benno had also lost his first spouse and children in the Holocaust. They married in the camp, and she gave birth to the first son there. My mother remembers meeting them at the ship when they arrived in New York Harbor. She actually held her young son that was born, uh, was born overseas after they got married. They sailed in New York for a while, then I went to work for a luggage maker or a luggage repairer. 
and eventually had another son who moved to Southern California. There, Bender opened up a factory making leather goods, and he wound up becoming an army contractor. And the business was a big success. In 1970, during the cross country vacation, my family visited them at their home in California. And that was the last we ever heard about Asa or her husband or her family until I received that email from George. I asked him, what is your connection? He said, my father Nachman was married to Hadassah. I have a picture of Hadassah that I'm attaching. The one here on the left. When I saw the photo, well, it seemed like it was pretty clearly the same person, just older. Had the sheets had the same hair, same widow's peak, just thinner, younger, more intense. She would been she resembled other members of my family. And the last name was one I knew for my research. George and I exchanged emails, comparing dates and the stories we had heard. He sent me more pictures of Nachman and Hadassah, like the ones that you see here. We were sure it was the same Hadassah, but only I had heard the stories about her life after the war, and he had heard the stories of the life from before the war. And of course, just what happened just after. Hadassah and Nachman lived in Points, Poland. They owned the leather luggage manufacturing business. In December 1939, before the war broke out, Nachman left Poland by himself. Then the Nazis invaded. The temporary separation became permanent. He made it to Argentina. They both thought the other had died, and they both had remarried. By 1950, Hadassah discovered that Nachman had survived and contacted him. Here's what else George wrote. The pictures we have from Hadassah says on the back that she was his girlfriend. We heard that my father was apparently married to her by a neighbor of his. Uh, we met by coincidence in the 1990s. We heard that my father received a letter from Hadassah after the war, uh, but he never answered her. Or maybe uh, he, he did, uh, but you know she was married with kids already. We started thinking that maybe they had kids and maybe I have a brother or sister somewhere in the world. How can it be that he left his family? I would think that he believed he will be able to bring an Argentina later and suddenly the war started and he couldn't go back or bring them. And maybe she didn't know what happened to him. If you have any idea how to find her sons, please let me know. Maybe they know more. My father never talked about his life in Poland. He smoked three packs per day that killed him at the age of 52 when I was a kid. Maybe guilty feelings. Unfortunately, 45 years after our visit, my parents no longer had the Dawson's contact information. George said he continued to search. I didn't hear from George for another five years. In 2020, George reached me out he to me again. He had not found Hadassah's sons, but he found the cemetery record. I went to cyclefindthegrave.com and found a photo of the tombstone. The first name's Matt, but the last name, which I have deliberately disguised on the tombstone, was slightly different from what my mother remembered. The tombstone know that they were Holocaust survivors. And I thought, yes, this had to be them. My mother hadn't been 100% sure that she remembered that last name exactly. So I did a quick Google search and came across an article about them in a local Jewish newspaper. Apparently, a Jewish fraternity at a university there was raising money to fight hunger, and they received an unusually large donation from Holocaust survivors. It was Hadass and Beno. The reporter had interviewed them and asked for the reason behind their gift. She had been in the in Auschwitz concentration camp for approximately three years when the approach of the Russian army prompted the Germans to force march her and her fellow inmates to Robbins Group, another Nazi concentration camp. A single loaf of bread was to be divided on the march of several days by her and three other females. That loaf was stolen from 
I know what hunger is, a gossip told the reporter. I don't want anyone else to experience it. The search also revealed that Hadassah had been interviewed and recorded by the USC Shoah Foundation, established by Steven Spielberg. I requested access to the interview. It turned out she had left behind two hours of recordings. I couldn't speak to her, but it wasn't until they, they hear her tell her own story of survival. The newspaper article had provided the bare bones of the outline. Three years in outskirts, a death march to Robinsbrook. The video also mentions a third camp called Neustadt Gleuda, the satellite camp of Robinsbrook, where she was liberated. Listening to those videos, all two hours of videos, what came across to me was her absolutely indomitable spirit. Even though she, her happy childhood as the daughter of a scribe and a general store owner in points was turned completely upside down by the Nazis. After the Nazis herded the Jews of Plensk into a ghetto, it was she who became the family breadwinner, sneaking out at night to sell the few items they still had left from the former general store. She talked about saying goodbye to her parents in the Plensk marketplace, from where they were marched to the train station and put on the transport to Auschwitz, where she, ne she never saw them again. And after she too was transported to Auschwitz, she survived on courage and determination. As in points, Adasa snuck out of the barracks at night. She gathered water or snow to drink and brought the excess into the bunk to trade the water for bread. She reported the Brocht commando, the prisoner in charge of handing out bread, for cheating the prisoners of bread. And it was Hadassah who was then put in charge of watching the bread being cut and handed out to the Auschwitz prisoners. She not only retained that role, but she was protected by other prisoners who trusted her. Through it all, and this is unbelievable to me, she managed to remain an optimist, while some other prisoners became hopelessly depressed, she would not allow herself to become pessimistic. According to the video, she sang, she told jokes, she imitated other people, and she encouraged prisoners to keep themselves healthy. But her health did deteriorate after the death march to Augsburg. She hung on, though. After liberation, she walked back to points with other camp survivors from that town, hoping to find her family. She didn't, but she did find the Polish woman who now had a sewing machine uh, from her mother's store. And she used that machine to start a business and support herself. But before long, she heard that there had been a pogrom in another Polish town, Kielce, and afraid the same thing might happen in points, even though before the war, relations she said between Jews and, and, and Catholics and Poland were very good, she did decide it was time to leave her hometown, this time for good. Like many other survivors, Hadassah entered one of the displaced persons camp. She learned from another Jewish woman that her sister, Chaya, a different Chaya from the one I mentioned before, by the way, had survived and was a Bergen Belsen, which is now a DP camp. That woman had told Chaya that she had four brothers and the best of them was Benno, and Chaya told her that her best sister was Hadassah. Adasa decided to go to Bergen Belsen to reunite with her sister. She dressed as a German, got herself forged papers in Russian and German, and smuggled herself into Bergen Belsen. She reunited with her sister, and there she met Benno. They married, and you know the story. After a few years, she came to New York with her young son and then moved to California. For me, the most powerful moment in her video is her description of arriving in Auschwitz and deciding, after realizing the horror of her situation, to survive. Let's hear from her herself. Well, describe what day-to-day -day life was like there after you were tattooed and you had your clothes and so on. They cut, the, they cut our hair, 
and uh, we went to the to the uh, black to the to the barrack to the barracks, and they give us a bed to sleep, six people or eight people on the on the preachers, you know, with no pillows, no on the birds. We were sleeping like this on the birds. What could you do? We tried, and then uh, all my friends, they went themselves to the guest chamber. They say, Hadassah, take a look. They killed our parents. They killed our sisters. They killed our... We have nothing but to live for. Let's go. And I say, don't go. Maybe, maybe a year, maybe a every year, Hitler will be gone and we will be free. We thought so, you know. I had big hopes, and I didn't go. A lot of them went. They chose to die? They chose to die. They didn't want to. They got so pessimistic. And I, and I say, no, I, I have my number. It's high on the hand. I have to live through Hitler. What does that mean? High means to life. In Jewish, high, 18. Your, the number's on your arm? My number on the arm was I put together uh, 27, 513. I put together 5 and 3 and 3 and 3. It's 18. I say, I have 18. I have life. I have to live through Hitler. Adasa and Darno were married for 50 years. I shared the video for George. And he listened very, very carefully to Adasa's description of days just before the war. Adasa talked about a friend who wanted to live, leave to Bolivia during the intention of Germany, he wrote. The friend is most probably my father, since he definitely arrived in Bolivia. She also said that her friend wanted to take her with them but that her father convinced her not to leave. This explains my question on whether she knew that my father escaped from the Polish army and had hid in a cargo vessel, the last one that left Poland prior to the war. And also in the first tape around minute 24, she said, my husband, my understanding is that they most probably were married. So now one of my most important questions was answered. Did she know that my father had gone to Bolivia? And she did. George also watched to see if he had a half brother or sister. In the tape where she talks about the first day of Auschwitz, she said that the Germans took the kids to one side and she to the other side. She doesn't mention the elderly or the sick. Maybe this is the moment that she lost her child. It seems, she wrote to me, that like many other survivors, she didn't want to talk about the painful parts. When she said, my husband, the interviewer didn't ask who was, who, um, who was her, or who was him. And in my opinion, she didn't want to talk about it as well. Maybe you will listen to the story and feel differently. But no doubt, this was a long journey for me. Meanwhile, my own long journey is continuing. It's been very gratifying to recover some of the forgotten and unknown stories of my family. But like all family researchers, I have brick walls to knock down. I have not been able to discover what happened to one of the people I am named after, Grandma Lena's brother, Aaron. All I have of him is a photo on the left presumably with his wife or fiancé, whose name I do not know. I have heard no stories about him. But I have found one record aside from the birth record, a list of Jewish refugees and Jews lacking means in Bangalore, who received matzah from the Joint Distribution Committee on February 25, 1940. And other than a few other facts in that record, if you had a family member, maybe her, they lived in Bangrove and Lublin. I know nothing more. I found records to verify the colorful but sad stories I heard about my grandmother's favorite sister, Esther, in the middle. That she had narrowly evaded a human trafficking scheme uh, and chose to stay in Poland even after my grandmother saved money to bring her to America. She is said to have died in a concentration camp. I don't know her married name or what happened to any children that she had, so it's made that difficult. 
to verify. I know even less about my father's family. Now, true, fortunately, nearly all of my father's family have left their ancestral towns not far from the deep Ukraine. They left just before and just after World War I. But I have found people my name, my last name in the Iska book from those towns. How might they have been related to us? And I know that my other grandmother had a sister named Sura, who remained in Western Ukraine. And that is a photo of her on the right. What happened to her? What happened to her family? I'm optimistic that I will learn more. Every week, more records are digitized and come online. My DNA app identifies new possible relatives every month. And any day, someone researching their family or one of my ancestral towns may contact me or post a new resource or clue on Facebook. So I'm looking forward to more reunions with relatives I don't know I have. Remembering the forgotten together. I hope this presentation inspires you here in the audience and you on Zoom and provides you with ideas for discovering your family's forgotten and hidden Holocaust stories. Thank you very much for watching and listening. That was amazing. Fascinating. So, thank you, Ellen, so very much. Um, I'd like to open to questions and answers. And I've been instructed to say that you should stand up. I'm going to give you the mic, speak into the mic. And, Ellen, will you be available to answer? Yeah, I'm just curious, why did you decide that 2% DNA match was a, was the level of which you would determine you would reach out to someone or find someone? How come 2% seems very low? It's true, it is low, but, uh, you know, to have, let's say, a child would be 50% match. Um, and when I look at all the records, what comes true, and according to these, I have thousands of DNA cousins, some of them are not definitely not cousins. Uh, they usually fall below like one or, or below, some are like 1.3, 1.5. So two is actually a very high percentage. And I found that when I reached out to those who choose to respond, not everyone does, understandably so. One of the is comfortable being reached out to by someone who they don't know. Um, a, a surprisingly large number have turned out to be relatives. Thank you very much. I had a comment and then a question one um, for your relative, Kadasa. How timely that uh, for you to use the words and her words, choosing life for this time of year. And then my question is, I think at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned finding out what the ancestral towns had done in terms of Holocaust remembrance and in addition to like Yes, I was curious about what you'd found out. Well, it's, boy, that's almost another presentation. But let's see if I can summarize it. Um, my, I'll, I'll talk about Bangalore, uh, and maybe at this time, the other towns. My grandma did not have good memories of Bangalore. She was um, not at all. And that kind of permeated with, you know, that was sort of what I thought too. And I knew nothing about it. She was poor, a lot of anti Semitism. Uh, she told some stories. Um, but then when I began to look into, look up and discover the town and began to look at the records and things, I found it was a much mixed, much more mixed picture than I, than my grandmother would have led me to believe. Uh, that it was a town rich with Jewish life, not just very Orthodox Jews, but also Jews with secular. And, belonging to uh, Zionist and Buddhist organizations um, that they participate in town life. There were troubles, yes. Um, but after the war, the town did some, has done some extraordinary things to remember the Jews. I actually, maybe you can advance the second part of the uh, appendix I have. Sure. I did add some additional pictures. So what I've discovered, <coughs> and began to look at is that the people 
in the town of Bengaluru had gathered, and this was during communist years, and it's a sort of defiance, this is not encouraged. And other ones gathered together the remaining tombstones from Bengal. The cemetery had been destroyed, but they found the tombstones and they put together a memorial of Lapidarium. All the tombstones in the, in the circle gathered together in one spot and then building a monument in the center. The Polish were in, to, in memory of the Jews of Bengal. And in the bottom of the memorial, it said, they wrote in Polish, do not murder, you know, from the, from the Ten Commandments. They have had commemoration ceremonies there to honor the memory of the Jews of the Holocaust. Uh, the one on the right was on the 70th anniversary of the liquidation of the, of the ghetto that was established in Bengal. And they invited representatives not just from Jewish clergy in Poland, but also from the Israeli government as well. And then very recently, they had a ceremony to honor a Bengalic woman who was killed by the Nazis for saving Jews. There are 11 righteous among, among the nations from the town of Bengal and nearby communities. And they recently had a, a sub a monument to in honor of a woman who was killed by the Nazis for trying to save uh, a, a Jewish family in Bengalic. Mm -hmm. Uh, the ceremony began the cathedral in the church in Bangalore. They had a long procession afterwards, uh, from there to the Jewish, to the Holocaust Memorial. And to the point where they printed up the booklets, badges, uh, laid flowers on the memorial. They had a rabbi from Warsaw came to speak there. And also the last picture, and I wish I bought the book now. <laughs> To the head of the home, but there was a Jewish photographer there named Alter Spielman before the war. He actually was the one who took some of the pictures that you saw of my family. And the public library in Bangalore had gathered together photos and did it and published a book to vote to his photographs of the town of Bangalore, including both you know the scenery, the buildings, the Jewish community there. As well as evidence, all kinds of photos that you might see any photographer take. Uh, Alfred Spielman did survive the Holocaust and, and, and then the. Imagine if the Birmingham Public Library had published a book like that under its own. That's what the Bangor Library had done. So, town, and despite the, the memories of my, the unhappy memories of my grandmother, it made me realize that there is another side to the story of Bangor. Alan, when did you start this journey, and how long have you been on the road? I have. I started this in about ten years ago. I began to get seriously interested. Um, what I think got it started was I discovered a a interview a an interview I had taken with my grandmother Lena many many years ago. I was a I was a college student or a graduate student. I was studying Jewish history at the time. And I interviewed her. I thought it was a terrible job. <laughs> a terrible job. It laid, it, it sort, of, sort of laid in the bottom of the drawer. I found it, and then there, you know, now there was the ability to digitize it, listen to it again. And I said, you know, it's not so bad. Better than I gave myself credit for it. I took it, I then went to say, edited it, and I matched it up with photos. From Bangor. Some of these folded from my mother's album. Other photos of Bangor are found. And it is down to like a 17 minute long video, which I shared with family members of uh, her describing her life in Bangor and my grandfather. And that kind of was a bit of a the kickoff, I think, to really, really getting started and, and investigating and looking into it. And since I had my college degrees on European history, it wasn't that hard and had a lot of research skills. It wasn't that hard for me to get started, know how to go about it, and all and all that. So it's been an enjoyable pastime with some time, some moments of tedium, going through old records, but also some of the kinds of discoveries like the ones I shared tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, Alan. Um, I, I'm sorry to Carol, who's sitting next to me, who heard me just the whole time you were talking, just, wow, wow. I mean, it's... <laughs> I think you heard that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So thank you for sharing your story today. I actually want to follow up on what you 
just said, if you um, might share one of the more challenging moments for you um, in your research, a time maybe when you sort of felt like you were hitting a roadblock, um, as I think gene genealogical research can can do, and and perhaps also the most powerful moment for you uh, over the last ten years of research. Yeah, it, it's sort of hard. The you know, those brick walls I mentioned. Well, that's a very very common term, and people do this sort of family research. Um, I really would like to know more about the man I named after Aaron. And it's very frustrating that, you know, it's very difficult to find that one record that was a big victory, but there was nothing else in the main mapping. And I don't even know why, really why, you know, that why was so special out of everyone that was, you know, the one, other than perhaps it was the one brother who, you know, other than Moshe took with that my grandmother had. And um, I really would like to know more. Um, I, about him, and that's been frustrating. Trying to go through records, find find them, and not being able to do that, and that's inevitable. Um, but at the same time, you know, yeah, think you know. I think for me, it was like getting the whole story about my great uncle Moshe because I tell us a story. I knew I did have a chance to meet that family in Israel when I was in college and spent some time there, and they were amazing. It's and but yeah, I lost touch and track of them. And to reconnect with them has really been tremendously just just wonderful. And then seeing my family, my daughters, my cousins, and them connecting. And we stay connected, we're still we're, we're still in touch. It's really good. That, that's really been great. And there have been some other, you know, cousins, very, very distant cousins who I discovered uh, from my grandfather's family. Um, turned out I have a whole branch of my family in Mexico. I, I had no idea I had Mexican cousins. I do now, which I do. So, you know, those are, it's those kind of surprises that really make it special, as well as, you know, you hope to find good stories, and, and every family has them. I've been lucky to find some of them. Well, I must say, Alan, that this has been spectacular. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And I know you told me when we first met that you would be willing to talk to anyone who wants to start on that kind of journey. Do I have that correct? Yes. And so for anybody, spread the word because we want the third, that's, this is all about the third generation learning this history and fascinating. Thank you so very much. Thank you for the opportunity.